When you're recovering from anything, routines are so important. Whether it's a broken arm, a broken heart, a bout of mental illness, or a years-long struggle with alcoholism, keeping a consistent schedule is critical to helping you overcome the past and move forward. Over and above everything else, that's who May is in Night in the Woods, a person in recovery. During the two weeks we spend with her, we see her attempt to recover from many unresolved traumas, from the depression and episodes of disassociation that forced her to leave college, to her lingering grief over the death of her grandfather and the impact that the killer incident still has over her life, there's no doubt that May has a whole host of difficulties to work through. So it should be no surprise that even from a gameplay perspective, Night in the Woods is very routine oriented. Every day we wake up, talk with May's mom, and then have the opportunity to check in with the large cast of minor characters, from Selmers, the amateur poet, to the always down in his luck Danny. And after we've had our fill of jumping on telephone poles and talking with cool folks like Pastor Kate and Bruce, we can pay a visit to Greg, or B, to advance to a hangout segment. And then, if you're up for it, you could always end the night by watching some TV on the couch with May's dad. Simple, predictable, and consistent. Exactly what someone who's in recovery needs. And if you're looking for evidence that May has grown and changed, that she is starting to develop positive habits and put the past behind her, then there's probably no better example than the routine she establishes with Mallard and the rat babies. By consistently visiting, feeding, and caring for the rats, May demonstrates that she's ready to move forward with her life, to care for someone other than herself, and begin to take on adult responsibilities. But before I go on, if you are a Night in the Woods fan, then please be sure to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me with a YouTube channel membership or over on Patreon. My dream is to make these videos full-time someday, and by doing any of those things, you'll be helping make that dream a reality. As I've discussed in other videos on this channel, it's after day four that Night in the Woods really kicks into high gear. That's when the majority of the town becomes available to the player, including the crucially important steps that lead up to the church of the first coalescence. These steps unlock not only the church, but provide May with a springboard to reach the telephone wires above town center. From there, she can find Roofcat, talk to Lori M, and of course, visit Mallard's tomb. May can find it by opening a window above the Telezoff building, climbing inside, and heading to the back area. There, she'll find Mallard P. Bloomingro, an old, dilapidated parade float she adored as a kid. According to May, Possum Springs used to have a big spring parade, not unlike Harfest from the sounds of it. But unfortunately, the annual parade was canceled indefinitely after Mallard broke free from its tethers and ran over a bystander's leg. Interestingly, the bystander in question was named Chris Evans, which I can only assume means that Mallard must be a member of Hydra. In any case, seeing Mallard stirs up quite a bit of emotion and nostalgia in May. To her, it's not just a parade float, it's a relic from her childhood. May certainly isn't Holden Caulfield, but I do think it's fair to say that she has a lot of Catcher in the Rye in her. There's a significant part of her that isn't ready to grow up, that isn't ready to accept that she's no longer a teenager, all of which no doubt ties back to the many traumas I mentioned earlier. It's hard to abandon nostalgia when every glance back at the past surely reminds her of her beloved grandfather, when such memories bring her back to a time before the killer incident, before the violent outburst that caused her to severely injure another person, drive her family to the brink of financial ruin, and cause the people of Possum Springs to ostracize her. Of course May builds an attachment to such a symbol. Who could blame her? Upon looking inside Mallard, May discovers that she is, as she puts it, pregnant, with some little rat babies. Determined to care for them, May promises to return with something to eat. She can then head down to the food stand in the trolley tunnel, 
and steal a pretzel to feed to the rats. It's not the most ethical way to feed them. The guy is just a small business owner trying to make ends meet. But he is a bit of a jerk, and it's just three pretzels. And more importantly, it's an incredibly fun segment. I've always enjoyed slowly reaching for the pretzel and doing my best to stay completely still just as the store owner's eyes begin to turn towards May. As May continues to bring these pretzels back to Mallard, more rat babies show up to eat them. After three days of delivering Possum Springs Uber Eats, the rats, which have now multiplied, break out of Mallard's belly and spread all over the building. May is overjoyed to see that her charges have left the nest, and with that, the questline ends. For now. In the epilogue, if you visit the abandoned food donkey, you'll discover that the rats have taken over that derelict building as well. These are both, on the surface, charming and hilarious moments where we see the wide-reaching impact that the seemingly small decisions May makes can have on her community. But viewed through an analytical lens, they say so much more. In 28 Days, a film about recovering from addiction, Steve Buscemi's character says, People in recovery want to know when's a good time to start dating. And my rule of thumb is, when you get home, get yourself a plant. I like spider plants, but whatever turns you on. Then, in about a year, get a pet. And then, if, say in two years, the plant and the pet are still alive, then you can start to think about having a relationship. I was a 14-year-old freshman way back in the halcyon days of 2006 when I saw the movie in my high school health class. All these years later, that quote has always stuck with me. I find it incredibly accurate. Before you can be responsible for others, you need to be responsible for yourself. Whether it's her naivete or innocent altruism, May frequently tries to care for others, like when she tries to support Greg in his post-knife fight meltdown, and B when she's upset about the mess her life has become after dinner at her house. Naturally, these attempts don't turn out particularly well. Again, she is trying, and for that, she deserves some level of recognition. But in all likelihood, this is a sign that she simply isn't ready to be responsible for another human being. To be the supportive friend, the one who builds up those around her when they're down, or provides good advice for a problem. It also shows that she's probably not ready for a relationship, though I don't think any of us are surprised by that. Still, it does show that she is ready to take on some level of responsibility. Feeding the rat babies, even for just three days, takes a significant amount of work on her part, including a couple of misdemeanors. It's certainly not comparable to caring for a pet, and it's really not close to caring for a plant either. But I think it's safe to say that it's a starting point before those two things. A prologue, if you will, to Steve Buscemi's post-recovery responsibility scale. It's one of those many small things that makes me so disappointed that we'll never get a night in the woods too. Because I have no doubt that a few years down the road, May would have been far enough along in her recovery to take on greater responsibilities. Whether that means buying a plant, adopting a pet, becoming the bee someone needs, or even starting a relationship. And that's what makes Mallard and her rat babies so important to Night in the Woods. Thanks for watching. Huge shout out to the illustrious Wolf Godwin and the incredible Jordy J. Morales Moreno for providing me with the music for these videos and the art for my channel. To check out both of these amazing creators, just follow the links down below in the description box. Huge shout out to James Pruitt, Corey Matson, Gustavo Balabi, Lil Caesar, Reed, and Pathonian, who get early access to these videos thanks to donations of $5 to $10 a month. See you guys next time.